Okay. Hi, everyone. It's great to be with you in this kind of crazy environment. Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk about this travel behavior implications. And certainly at any point, uh, feel free to ask questions or interrupt. I think it should be kind of short. and We should have plenty of time for questions afterwards too. So I do travel behavior research. And so I'm going to talk about this um, this interface between autonomous vehicles and people. And you know what I like to say to more engineering types is that there are people in the system and they're not robots, right? So we have to understand how they're gonna behave. And, um, and in this, when I talk about behavior here, I'm not talking about the human computer interface and the human factors and stuff, how the person interacts with the vehicle, but really how the vehicle interacts in people's lives and how they travel differently and may have, we have different um, types of travel patterns and activity patterns. So that's what we're focusing on here. Maybe even you know living patterns where you choose to live. So I'm actually, I ask my students what's good, um, what helps them in terms of this Zoom learning environment, and they said polls do. So I have a set of polls in here that we're going to be doing. So first of all, I'm going to start with your first poll. So this is the question, do you think autonomous vehicles, and I'm talking about level four or five, so ones that really can drive themselves um, without human interaction over at least broad areas of space, like a metropolitan region. Okay, so we have 60% of you have voted. Few more, few more. Wow, it's quite even. I shouldn't influence you. Now I've anchored, I'm, I've influenced you on there. Okay, so let me go ahead and share this. So this is what you said. So it's pretty even here. Three say yes, uh, four say yes, three say no, and five say it depends. I was thinking of not leaving it depends because it just seems like, yeah, of course it depends. But, um, oh, okay. So now you guys can see the results here. All right, so now... Let me go through and just try to dissect this a little bit. This is really kind of the question we're trying to get at with a lot of this research is, you know, how is it going to impact the, um, the city and transportation? So let's pull. Ooh. Think. You could try to click in the slide, see if that goes. Okay, yeah, thanks. Okay, so you know one of the things with autonomous vehicles, when you when you see this vision out here, all these pictures, it all looks so utopian, right? It looks very safe. It looks like traffic's flowing. It looks like you know these nice clean vehicles. Um, the the person behaving perfectly well, attentive to the road, hands on, you know, ready to take over. So um, so we have this utopian vision that often shows up when we're talking about autonomous vehicles, but. When you look at what um, you know, what the reality is now, and actually with COVID, things are a little bit better, but we are getting back to this reality that we have widespread spread congestion in every metropolitan environment in the world. Um, and okay, oops. And then the future reality, sure, automation, there's no question, it will improve efficiency. You can get more throughput, it will be safer. But I would say not enough to relieve congestion just because we have these opposing trends. We have increasing population, we have increasing urbanization, and we also have this steady rise of increasing vehicle miles traveled per capita. So while we get more efficiency, we also have all these other things that are leading to more vehicles on the road. Kind of this, what I see is this insatiable demand for um, for travel. And so in order to get this utop utopian response, we do need behavior change and even under the most optimistic technology scenarios. So here we have another poll here. So the, um, okay, so the question is what kind of behavior change could we look at, be looking at? You know, one of them is that maybe people um, won't own vehicles. They'll be using this kind of shared fleet. And so here's the question here. Do you think you're gonna own? Do you think you're gonna share? Or are there any people? All right, we have a transit. We had our first transit person. 
See if we can get a few more votes here. We have 60% of you voting. 76, okay. Let me share this with you. And so here you guys do have a feeling, a lot of you that you are going to be using shared services instead of owning your autonomous vehicle. So let's go ahead and start to look into this a little bit. Okay, so this is so, <laughs> the, view, the version one was, gosh, everything's just gonna be flowing. It's really gonna solve all of our problems. Version two is, well, people aren't gonna own cars anymore and people are going to share, um, we're, we'll use the shared services like an Uber and Lyft, but with autonomous vehicles. And so let's start looking at this. So, you know, how does this argument come about? Well, the argument comes about, first of all, there's a cost argument that it's just gonna be, um, more cost effective to use shared fleets instead of um, owning your own vehicle. So that's one argument. Another one is convenience. So it's just, well, you know, gosh, you're not going to have to park it. You're not going to have to deal with your car, the maintenance and all these things. And that, um, that could be true. One of the things is that there will be inconveniences too. So having an autonomous vehicle well, you're not gonna to have to deal with parking, right? You can send it off to parking, you can send it off to get gas. So it already has a convenience built in that often the Uber Lyft um, right now is, is taking care of that. So we have the convenience. And then the other thing is, I don't know if you, over Thanksgiving, one of the grocery delivery services, did you follow that? I, mean, I don't know if it was just in Berkeley or not, but people made orders for Thanksgiving, for their Thanksgiving meal. And the service got overwhelmed in some reason and didn't get these deliveries out to people. So, you know, the shared world, it's its not necessarily this utopian um, going to always have this vehicle available to you. If you've ever tried to use Uber and Lyft in a, you know, very um, high demand time, it's actually very difficult. That's not going to go away with the autonomous vehicle. So convenience could be an issue. And then flexibility. So the idea that, well, you can have the type of car you want when you're going to the mountains, you can get all wheel drive, you can get a convertible to drive along, you know, the beach or something, you know, you can get the car you want for the, for the right time. So that flexibility is there for sure. Um, so, but let me, the cost argument is really what drives a lot of this. I'm going to go to the third poll. And so this poll kind of looks at this cost argument. So think about the car you own, if you own one, and is it the cheapest available that meets your mobility needs? This is great. We have a pretty heterogeneous crowd, which is nice. I like that. It's one of the rules in travel behaviors that are behavior in general that people are very different. Okay, so let's share the results here. You guys are seeing the results, is that right? When I share them? Um, all right, so what you said, so four of you, I mean, that's a lot when I ask this question. So four of you do have a very inexpensive car that really is just there for your mobility needs. Seven of you don't, and that's what I would say a lot of times are, you know, there's a, there's something about our car ownership and there, there's an image and a, and a style and all sorts of other things that <clears throat> we think about and when we purchase vehicles that, um, that lead to this cost argument isn't always the, uh, you know, we're not really making this decision purely on cost. Three of you don't own a car, which is great. Okay, so back out of here. Okay, now another experiment here. So this is from one of these studies. This is an image of a potential autonomous vehicle in the future. And so now what I want you to do is I want you to think about some future world where you can um, call up this car and take a trip. And I want you to think as detailed as you can. Like, how are you going to use this car? Think about going on a certain trip. Where are you going? Who's with you? What are you doing in the car? So if you wanna close your eyes a little bit and kind of ponder this. You guys all have a picture in your mind now? All right, so nopes, get out of here. I am going to 
do the next poll. So now think about that trip that you imagined. And how many of you imagined that a stranger was with you? How many imagined you were going to the transit station? How many imagined both those things? You were a stranger and, and neither. Okay, here, not much heterogeneity. Okay, so everyone said neither, right? So, and what's the issue here? The issue here is that um, if we're just going to have all these, you know, cars being used the same way, um, single riders, then we, let me see, stop sharing. Um, this is so uh, this is making this argument here. So this, this is a old graphic from a biking um, advocacy group that basically shows that, well, how much space do you need to move a hundred people? So bus requires a small amount of space. Bikes also requires a fairly small amount of space. Cars, if you have one person in each car, requires a much bigger amount of space. So this idea of how much space you're using to uh, move people in an area. And then, oh shoot, you know, you would think after how many, six months or eight months, we would know how to use this stuff by now, but okay. And then here, as someone pointed out that, well, when you move from car to shared services, Uber and Lyft, and you move to an autonomous car, this math doesn't change at all, right? In terms of how much space you need to move people. Oh shoot, sorry about that. Um, and it's actually worse because of ghost trips, the idea that the car's driving around, not moving person, but relocating a vehicle or, um, or doing things like that. What we're going to see in the experiment later is that this ghost trips is a pretty serious issue with autonomous vehicles. Oh, gosh. I don't know why it keeps going back to that. Okay. So version three is that, you know, we need autonomous, but we need all these other things too. We need people to be sharing the vehicles. We need the vehicles to be connected. You guys all have a handle on that. You just get more efficiency. We need them to be clean um, in terms of energy, right? So we want them to have a, use a, a clean power source, right size. So that I have a colleague in uh, applied economist here on campus who thinks that everyone's going to be driving Winnebago's in the future because we, you know, you just get to drive around, you can live your life as, as you're moving around and getting to the places you need to go. Equitable, of course, we have to worry about that people, all segments of society are served and given good mobility. And then I put priced here. I don't think we can get to this utopian future without having a um, price system. So everyone needs an acronym. So this is the acronym for just putting all these in order. So PACERS is my acronym. All these things are what we need. And then trying to come up with a picture for it. Any Indiana PACER fans out there? No? Oh, shoot. Why do I? Okay. Uh, you guys remember the PACER car? PACER bike, we're getting a little closer to an image here. But this is actually the image that I think makes the most sense for this, which is the PACER for something like a marathon, the, the person who runs at a steady pace to make sure everyone gets across the finish line. So um, what we need to think about this autonomous vehicles of the future is how we can <clears throat> really kind of move steadily in a direction so that we end up with this environment and this urban environment that we really care about. Okay, so here's poll five. And here again, you want to think about if you had an autonomous vehicle in the future, how do you think your travel would change? Hard question to answer. Okay, so here we go. So um, 
some people say less, some people say more, and most of you are saying, or half of you are saying that you'll travel about the same. Let me ask one more question in this direction. And now think about where you live, right? So do you think um, if you had an autonomous vehicle, you'd either move farther from the city, closer to the city, or it wouldn't change where you live? Okay, so most of you here say that you don't think it would change where you live. Some people would move farther. No one would move closer. All right, so these types of questions, these are the types of questions that the behavioral researchers are trying to focus on, right? So we're trying to look at this future and understand what is going to happen to this travel behavior. So there is consensus that vehicle miles per person will increase and the question is by how much. Um, probably a larger proportion of people won't own cars just because there's a, this good alternative, right? That's one of the things that Uber and Lyft have brought is this uh, decent alternative to not owning a car and still having high quality um, mobility. But the question is how much of a larger proportion? Higher proportion of trips will probably be shared ride. How much more? Uh, vehicles will change size and function. Will they become smaller or larger? Um, On-demand delivery is escalating, especially now with COVID, right? So what kind of traffic will this generate? Um, and so when we're trying to think about whether this future is going to increase congestion or decrease congestion, you know, we want these things to go in a certain direction. So VMT will increase. Well, we want it to increase as little as possible. Uh, more people uh, not owning cars, more shared ride, um, we want the vehicles to be right size, things like that, that all of these things will lead to this lower congestion. So we have to try to understand how, um, which direction these things are going to move in. Okay, so now this is where we get into the travel behavior research. So there's a rich transportation behavior literature that looks at all sorts of uh, impacts on travel behavior and trying to understand how these different policies would impact travel behavior. The issue with autonomous vehicles is that it's really difficult to study because um, the technologies don't exist on the road. I mean, they do, but not in a way that you can really use them for your life. And so there are different approaches that are used. One of them is people are doing, we have these urban micro simulators. Um, and so people are running these micro simulators, just making careful assumptions on parameters and this future environment to try to see how things will play out. There's a lot of survey response uh, literature where we just ask questions. So these are the kind of questions I asked you, you know, if you owned an autonomous vehicle, how would you behave differently? Really hard to answer that, right? I don't know if you felt that it was hard to figure out what your life would be like and how it would change. Um, people are doing virtual reality and gaming experiments. And then they're also doing field experiments using analogous modes and prototypes. So I'm actually gonna spend quite a bit of the rest of the talk focusing on an experiment I've been working on in this last stage. But let me first uh, talk about just some of the findings on travel behavior impacts of AV. So one of the super consistent finding is that we can drastically reduce our vehicle fleet and serve the demand. So we need about 10% of the current cars, again, if we're in this efficient shared mode system. Um, but vehicle mile travel increases. And so there are lots of papers with lots of different assumptions based on all different future scenarios. All of them point to vehicle miles travel increasing for various um, reasons. Some of it's just vehicle relocating to pick people up, this ghost trip concept. Um, some of it is that, well, the it's, um, more convenient and less task, uh, you know, since you can multitask in the car and stuff, you can, uh, you can hear it's less owners to drive. You spend more time in the car in different aspects like that. People today are willing to pay for automated vehicles. So about 5,000 on average, and it ranges from zero to over $10,000. And um, there's hesitancy towards adoption and sharing. Most people say that they would prefer to own versus sharing. 
Okay, so that's some of the literature. And now what I'm gonna do is talk about a particular experiment I've been running with um, PhD student Mustafa Harb actually just signed off on its dissertation yesterday, which is very exciting. And this has been a long journey because it was hard to get this experiment run and through the, the liability of the university and human subjects and all this stuff. But this is the way this experiment works. So we're interested in understanding travel behavior in this future world with a fully autonomous vehicle. So you don't have to drive the car. You can do full multitasking. You don't have to worry about parking. You can also send the vehicle on errands to get gas or go to the grocery store and pick things up, okay? Um, and the simulation of the future, we use basically a personal driver, a chauffeur. Because if I were to give you a chauffeur, it's similar to having an autonomous vehicle. We've, you, we've taken the driving task away from you as an autonomous vehicle. It's not perfect, but it does certainly cover these things. You don't have to drive the car. You um, can have full multitasking. You don't have to worry about parking. You can send it on errands. And so through this experiment, we're able to test this scenario of basically private vehicle ownership. So there are these two models of either sharing vehicles or um, private vehicle ownership. And here we're just looking at this private vehicle ownership scenario. Um, and so, oops, go back. So in the scenario, when we give them the chauffeur, basically the subjects use their own household vehicle. That's important, right? Because part of it is you have your own car, you have your own space, and you're covering the expenses of it. You're covering the wear and tear, you're covering the gas, you're covering uh, parking, tolls, whatever it is. So the subjects actually use their own vehicle, which was important for the experiment. And we do provide the chauffeur to the household for free. So we're kind of giving them this extra technology for the autonomous vehicle. And the chauffeur actually stays, stays with the car, whether it's in use or not, so that they can call this car at any point, they can send it on errands. And we used a chauffeur service um, for this project. So this is the way the experiment worked. We ran a beta test, then we ran another recent test in Sacramento. So I'll talk mostly about the Sacramento results, but we recruited from the Sacramento area in California, the state capital of California, um, had done a household travel survey. So we recruited people from their survey into our survey. So we had a week in which they had already had their, their trips tracked and we did a sampling um, from that population about 4,000. Our sample was just 44 households. Uh, this, this experiment costs around $2,500 a household, mostly because of the chauffeur experiments. So, but we recruit people into our sample. We have an entrance phone interview that took about 45 minutes to an hour, just talking people through the whole thing, answering questions, really trying to get them to think about this experiment we're trying to run and how we are trying to mimic this future world and trying to help them to think through how they may travel differently in this future world. We also had an entrance, um, more traditional survey just to get some more demographics, basic travel habits, attitudes, things like that. Once someone came into the survey, er, into the experiment, they were in it for at least three weeks, some a little bit more. But we had these status quo weeks bookending the chauffeur week. So first of all, they came in for a week. Through these three weeks, three weeks, we tracked the people through a phone app so that we know where they're traveling. And they were asked questions, why are you traveling? So we got trip purpose, we got mode, we got who they're traveling with, all sorts of stuff like that. So very detailed information on the movements and activities of all the adults in the household. We also tracked all the vehicles in the household through this device called automatic. So we plugged this into each of the vehicles and we had the track of that. The chauffeur also had the our move app on their phone. So the chauffeur's recording information. So we had all this wealth of information basically for this three week period um, for the members of the household. The minors we don't track because that's a problem. So the um, traveling with children, we had to get through the reporting of the adults in the household and the chauffeur. So basically you come in for a week, you're just tracked, traveled as normal. Then the second week you were given 60 hours of chauffeur service. So 60 hours, just cause it got too expensive. Ideally this would be 24 seven for months, right? But this is, um, uh, this is what the budget allowed. We gave them 60 hours. They could allocate those hours as they like, and they could actually move it. The chauffeur service was pretty good about moving it if people had to move these. 
And then during that week, again, with the chauffeur service, that chauffeur was in your car for those 60 hours and they could be texted and, um, and called and sent on errands or taken various places. They could loan the car out to people as long as they loaned both the car and the chauffeur. They couldn't just loan the chauffeur out. Okay, and then afterwards we had another week of status quo. And then offboarding, we had an exit survey where we got information about, uh, um, again, asking their attitudes about the autonomous vehicles and about the experiment. Okay, so that is the experiment. Let me talk through some of the results here. Um, so again, we did a beta test in 2017, just 13 subjects. It was a, very, it was a convenient sample. We ran it again in uh, 2020. And then in fact, we hit right up against COVID. So we had a 50 person sample planned and then we dropped, we had to drop the last six because we ran into the shutdown. But so it was 44 Sacramento area households, 78 individuals in those households. It was a fairly representative sample, except that we had higher income people and also higher educated people. And this isn't ideal, it, um, but it also is, if we're looking at this future of the people who are going to own autonomous vehicles, they will skew higher to higher income and higher education, most likely. Um, let's see. So I should have asked you first, but what did you, you, so basically what we do is we compare that chauffeur week to the two um, status quo weeks on either end. And what we found, and this was similar to the beta test, is that there's a dramatic increase in vehicle miles traveled. So a 60% increase in vehicle miles traveled and that the elderly and disabled were the highest. Um, they actually increased by 150% and families with kids were the lowest, which was interesting. Uh, what we felt is that their schedules were so tight that they couldn't adjust as much. They were already, and they were also already more auto-oriented. Um, we did have a really interesting household that had someone who wasn't able to drive. They had a disability that didn't allow them to drive. And so this really with the chauffeur service, they used to have a long transit trip to work. They, they replaced all their transit with the driving. So, you know, again, that's one of the things about this 60% increase in VMT is kind of shocking, but it's also, there's a real value in it, right? That it is enabling people, it's giving them a mobility they didn't have before. And so there is this um, good side of it. Okay, so the breakdown here in terms of this VMT, this is where the ghost trips come up. So every, I think almost every single one of our households did send the vehicle by itself to do something, to run an errand, to go pick someone up or drop someone off. People who had a long commute to downtown uh, went to down, you know, went to work and then sent the car home to park to avoid the parking fees. Um, and so 50% of this is actually the vehicle traveling around with only the chauffeur in it. That's what the ghost trips is. And then also people traveled farther. Their activities. Um, in terms of the number of activities, it was actually quite consistent, but they traveled farther. So they went to a restaurant that was a little bit farther away. There were actually quite a bit increase of interregional trips, like going to say San Francisco or Napa Valley, things like that. And then there was some mode shift. This was a this sample was fairly auto oriented to begin with, but there was a um, big hit on all the other modes. So transit use dropped by 70%, biking dropped by 37%, and walking dropped by 13%. These statistics, they're all just for calculated for our sample. We didn't try to weight it to the um, population just because it, it's too small and quirky of a sample. So these are just really the numbers from our sample itself. Um, to project it to the population would take a bigger sample and, uh, okay. And then the other thing, so all these numbers look bad, right? There's all this negative to it, it but again, there is this beauty to it that, um, you know, this is just one of the quotes. So in the exit survey we had, and the PhD student actually got to know these 44 households quite well. I mean, there are also all these issues that happened with the chauffeur and 
I don't know. So he was on the phone with these people a lot. And we had also had these open-ended questions, but here's just one example. And there was a lot of positive response to having a chauffeur. It made people's lives a lot easier in a lot of ways. So here's one. I've already gone to two places I never would have driven to on my own. And it's been wonderful. Okay. So we also did some, so those were just the descriptive statistics. We also looked into some modeling of the travel behavior. It was a small sample, but we actually were able to do some kind of simple travel demand models. And so what's showing on the right here, this is the what's called an activity-based model for the Sacramento region. So these are these large scale micro simulation models that break down the um, travel behavior into components that are then connected together in various ways. So at the top of this figure, it, and it's a hierarchical model. So we have the longer term choices, like where people work and where people live and how many cars they own. And then the short term choices in the middle. So this is on a typical day, where, how many trips do people make? Where are they going? What mode are they using? What timing are they using? All these things. And so we focused on these short term choices and we basically estimated the models for the chauffeur week. We estimated the models for the non-chauffeur week and then we compared the results. Um, one of the interesting things was we found is that the standard short-term models were pretty stable and that there, there wasn't a lot of adjusting that has to be done, except that the value of time for the auto decreased by 60%, which is a lot. So basically what that is, is it's just the idea that driving, when you don't have to drive, driving somewhere is much less onerous. So that's what it means by this decrease in the value of time and that people are willing to be spend more time in the car than they were before because they can do other things. They're not driving, they're um, all sorts of things like that. That leads to, so this one parameter that changes this value of time leads to two different shifts that the mode shift towards auto. So this is people moving away from transit, walking and biking to auto trips and also people traveling farther. Um, again, as I pointed out before, there are significant ghost trips. So this isn't anywhere in the modeling framework. So these ghost trips need to be modeled. We didn't model them except that one of the things we found is that they do separate out quite well. So we can separate the ghost trips from when there's a person in the car and the models for the individuals actually are quite consistent. And then we need to model the ghost trips and put them in this framework, but it actually can plug into this framework quite easily in terms of um, additional trips and tours and destinations. And so that seemed promising. The other thing is, is that this model focuses on trips within the region. And one of the things we found is, found is that there was a increase in interregional trips. And so that would have to be modified in this framework. Okay, oh, shoot. I was doing so well and then, okay. So let me just go on to the, let me just ask this question again that we started with. Uh, do you think autonomous vehicles will improve congestion? All right, 71% of you. Okay, so here, and I can't remember where we started with, but um, looks like we're about kind of similar. And, you know, again, a lot of this, the lesson is it just, it really does depend, right? So when you think about this planning for the future, again, to it's really important to recognize that there are people in the system. Uh, stop sharing. They aren't robots <laughs> and that, we can't be naive about behavior, right? So um, I think it's dangerous to underestimate the attachment to one's own car and everything we look at leads to significantly more vehicle miles traveled. And so in looking at this, we really do need to worry about the policy that now's the time to act because once our behavior is formed, it's really hard to change. And once items are free, it's hard to charge for them. So in particular, those ghost trips need to be dealt with now. Um, 
We need to think about the system in terms of public private service that in particular equity issues, making sure that people are, everyone in society is given high quality mobility. Um, it, I think it's good to think about this kind of dynamic evolution that if we need people more to share vehicles and share rides, try to nudge in that direction. And then we can scale up these things to larger vehicles um, and have innovation on high capacity automated vehicles and transit systems. I think we need to embrace experimentation more. I think we've learned a lot from this chauffeur experiment just to really give people the experience. And there are all sorts of limitations with the chauffeur experience that I haven't gone through. I can talk about them later. So it's certainly far from perfect, but it does give people a sense to kind of really be able to react and, um, and modify their behavior in a way that they may in the future. And that the status quo, I think if we stick with our status quo, we're gonna be in trouble. We really need to think about incentives and disincentives for our behavior. Okay, so that is it. I'm gonna stop sharing so I can kind of see you guys. So, um, all right, 1037, so that's yeah, good. good timing. Yes, thank you, Jean, for, for your talk.